Welcome to the, this is the, now the third episode of the Revolution and Ideology podcast. Um, I'm Nick Lee. And I'm Jared Benson. In this episode, we're going to be finishing up our discussion on human nature. We started that in the last episode where we discussed Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques uh, Rousseau, uh, our boy JJ. Um, we discussed their theories at length. We focused uh, most of our time on Rousseau's theory. So if you want to go back and catch up uh, now with us, you can do that in episode number two. Uh, now we're going to discuss, fast forward a little bit, and talk about sort of modern anthropological and archaeological discuss and discussions about human nature and the sources of uh, inequality in society. If you remember from the last episode, the whole goal of this portion of our podcast is to try to uh, explore two main questions, which are, <coughs> can stateless societies exist, and uh, if so, how would we get there? And then we decided to start that conversation by exploring the roots of inequality uh, in human society. So our jumping off point for this episode is really the fact that Rousseau's hypothesis comes to dominate the discourse surrounding the origins of inequality for so long. Um, just to sum up, Rousseau's thesis is that basically the agricultural revolution led to surplus, and then the controlling of that surplus led to inequality and stratification, civilization, etc., uh, in human society. Today we're going to be discussing an article by David Graeber and David Wingrow, though I'll probably just refer to Graeber for simplicity's sake. Um, they actually have two works here. The first was the academic article published in 2015 that's titled Farewell to the Childhood of Man, Ritual, Seasonality, and the Origins of Inequality. And then they followed that up three years later uh, in 2018 with a web article titled How to Change the Course of Human History. We'll link to both of those epi the articles in the show notes so you can read whichever one you'd like. But the quotes I'm going to go into here come from the web article, How to Change the Course of Human History, just because it's the most accessible and probably the most likely that uh, you guys will read. Uh, also, as we mentioned in the previous episodes, our goal for this is we're really following along with the research that Jared and I are doing uh, in preparation for a class that we're going to be teaching this summer about stateless societies. So I'm trying to pick the most accessible readings that hopefully our students will actually do. Um, I doubt that, but at least we can hope and try. So We're dreamers. We're dreamers. Yeah, they're probably more likely to read the web article than they are the academic article. And there's so much overlap between the two. The web article is based on the academic article, so we're not going to lose a lot by just uh, focusing on that. So first, uh, they talk about how J.J. Rousseau's main hypothesis has dominated the discourse for so long. Um, and really the main basis of their article is to challenge that discourse and to challenge the fact that it's been so dominant. So uh, the first quote I have, Graeber says, Almost everyone knows this story in its broadest outlines. Since at least the days of John Jack Rousseau, it has framed what we think the overall shape and direction of human history to be. This is important because the narrative also defines our sense of political possibility. Most see civilization, hence inequality, as a tragic necessity. Some dream of returning to a past utopia, of finding an industrial equivalent to primitive communism, or even in extreme cases of destroying everything and going back to being foragers again. But no one challenges the basic structure of the story. There's a fundamental problem with this narrative. It isn't true. So he's saying, most people start from the premise that the Rousseau, Rousseau's hypothesis is true and then seek to change society as a result. But he says, the very starting off point is false, that the we need to question that narrative uh, itself. He continues, Overwhelming evidence from archaeology, anthropology, and kindred disciplines is beginning to give us a fairly clear idea of what the last 40,000 years of human history really looked like, and in almost no way does it resemble the conventional narrative. Our species did not, in fact, spend most of its history in tiny bands. Agriculture did not mark an irreversible threshold in social evolution, the first cities were often robustly egalitarian. Um, then he goes on to talk about why Rousseau's agriculture hypothesis continued to dominate the discourse so much, and he takes a brief moment to bash Jared Diamond. Uh, I didn't really know before reading into this more 
how much David Graeber seems to hate Jared Diamond, but it's kind of entertaining. And he, he <laughs> it's all about guns, germs, and steel. He uh, destroys him quite a few times in this article. Um, he actually says one of the problems with Rousseau's hypothesis is the question itself, uh, the question, uh, what is the origin of social inequality? He says uh, simply framing the question this way means that we have to make a series of assumptions well, first, that there is a thing called inequality, and second, that it is a problem. Third, there was a time when it did not exist. Uh, so he says the term inequality is itself a loaded term. Uh, quote, unlike terms such as capital or class power, the word equality is practically designed to lead to half measures and compromise. One can imagine overthrowing capitalism or breaking the power of the state, but it is very difficult to imagine eliminating inequality. In fact, it's not obvious what doing so would even mean, since people are not at all the same and nobody would particular, particularly want them to be. Inequality is a way of framing social problems appropriate to technocratic reformers, the kind of people who assume from the outset that any real vision of social transformation has long since been taken off the political table. It allows one to tinker with the numbers, argue about Gini coefficients and thresholds of dysfunction, readjust tax regimes or social welfare mechanisms, even shock the public with figures j showing just how bad things have become. Can you imagine? 0.1% of the world's population controls over 50% of the wealth, all without addressing any of the factors that people actually object to about such unequal social arrangements. For instance, that some managers, some manage to turn their wealth into power over others, or that other people end up being told their needs are not important, and their lives have no intrinsic worth. The latter, we are supposed to believe, is just the inevitable effect of inequality, and inequality, the inevitable result of living in, the, in any large, complex, urban, technologically sophisticated society. That is the real political message conveyed by endless invocations of an imaginary age of innocence before the invention of inequality. That if we want to get rid of such problems entirely, we'd have to somehow get rid of 99% of the Earth's population and go back to being tiny bands of foragers again. Otherwise, the best we can hope for is to adjust the size of the boot that will be stomping on our faces forever, or perhaps to wrangle a bit with more wiggle room in which some of us can at least temporarily duck out of its way. So what do you think about this argument that even the discussion of inequality is a fallacy in the beginning? So Graeber has great points, and it did get me to, to rethink the way... I, in my individual classes, and we, in our, our, our team talk classes, like Ideologies and Isms, approach this subject and the construction of a social pyramid. We, I freely admit that, that I tend to also gravitate towards uh, the, the Rousseau viewpoint that it was the development of surplus that started this process, and now I'm even questioning the use of inequality, but certainly stratification and hierarchy. Um, and, and you'll get to Graeber's other theories as we go through this, but in previewing some of them, I do think that Graeber makes some very good points, and there needs to be much more nuance in that narrative. But I, I, I don't feel compelled uh, to discuss, or well, to even engage the idea that somehow, somewhere along the way, within the last, whatever, six to 10,000 years from the agricultural revolution, that there has not been a pretty clear trajectory. I think there has been, and I'm not sure he's even disputing that, but I want to get into the nuance later when, when we get into some of those other quotes. To speak directly to your question to me about inequality, I, I actually like the idea that he's questioning, what does that mean? Does it mean, are we seeking uniformity? Are we seeking to all be automatons in one way, whether that's in a foraging, hunting, gathering society, or is it in a mass industrial society? Um, I think he's asking very good questions. I still don't know that the questions he's asking, or even in the examples that he's going to provide later, that we see a very clear deviation from the general narrative, or at least not verification or proof thereof. I, I think that it's important that we begin to ask these questions, though, in the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish, and even in the title of his article, um, the possibility of something else. I do like his optimism that it is not 
quote unquote guaranteed that this is our trajectory and this is the way it's going to be that inequity or inequality for us to have this modern industrialized society with technological comforts and so on and so forth is going to naturally breed inequality I do think there's opportunity for us to maintain at least certain sub levels of our lifestyle whether that's in terms of comfort or security or resource extraction whatever that might be without necessarily adding in layers of haves and have nots Right. So I do like his optimism there. So it's not like a full blown critique of Graeber, but I don't I'm not so sure that we can kind of start throwing out the ideas of these philosophers that we talked about in the last episode. So. So I interpret what he's saying as the problem with discussing inequality is that it's too narrow of a question because it's really, really easy for the elite to put the focus of social change on inequality because it's impossible to address and no one really knows what it would be like, what it would mean to address that anyways. So it, it basically by focusing on inequality itself and making that the target of social change, it sort of removes the power from the people to make any real kind of social change. But I think if we look at it in, in terms of inequality, I like to focus not necessarily on inequality on how it exists, but on how it manifests. So in terms of opportunity. And I think... It is, I think he's being dismissive of this idea that we're not necessarily those of us that are drawing inequality, uh, we're not, that are critiquing inequality and its various manifestations. I think he's making a mistake by arguing that we don't actually know what that means. I think we do. I think we, it's opportunity. Now, if you have, if everyone has an equal opportunity and then chooses to squander that, so be it. But right now, we're starting with complete inequality and opportunity, and I think that is a byproduct of this stratification and trajectory that we have been on since surplus. So at no point in looking at what Graeber had written in at least these two selections was I don't recall opportunity ever being actually addressed. Okay. That's a much bigger conversation I think that maybe we can come back to, but whether or not the goal is just equality of opportunity or not. That is a that is a much bigger bigger conversation that I don't know that we can address. But I think yeah. at some point in this in this in this what we're doing here in discourse on this topic, we're going to have to we're going to have to have that if we want to envision what a stateless society looks like. Is what does opportunity look like? Again, a stateless society is going to and Graeber actually addresses this later, and you're going to get to it regarding like the beauty of the individual. We're not looking to create everybody like one size fits all molds of human beings. That's that's an impossibility. People are born, mm -hmm. and Rousseau talked about this physiologically different or psychologically different. We not everybody is going to be the same, but everybody should be given the same opportunities from the get go. And again, from in my this is my opinion, and based on the the, the studies that we've done, opportunity is where limitations have been placed. I definitely won't disagree with that. Okay. But are we focused on in creating this state, in creating a stateless society, are we focused on the opportunity or the outcome for every individual? That's a great question. I mean, at this point, sitting here right this second, I think opportunity has to come first. Okay. I mean, it has to, it has to. If you can at least make the, 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 the playing field level, for all, for, all, for all participants, regardless of status, family status, hierarchy, lineage, race, gender, uh, sexuality, all of these other various layers that over, again, the course of history have been used uh, with derogating results against various populations. Um, I think that's where you have to start. And then once we see how that develops, we can then address what outcome looks like. I mean, my... My hypothesis would be that if we had a actual equality and opportunity for everyone, then the outcome would also be equal. I mean, it would have to be, right? I'd like to assume because alongside that equal opportunity, that means things like as, as basic as education would also then be equal, right? And, and these things that guide us all on our individual paths within our societies would then naturally gravitate towards everybody having the same opportunities, which would lead to equitable outcomes. Again, in theory, mm -hmm. we have yet to really see this in history. Graeber's an anthropologist, and he draws upon, of course, archaeological studies, so they're drawing from, from very different sources than I as a historian. I'm looking at everything that's been written down, and basically, uh, to be blunt, most of what I've looked at since things have been written down were produced by societies that were already inequitable. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, then he continues on to talk about the negative ramifications for continuing Rousseau's narrative 
Uh, he takes some more time to bash Diamond, and he throws in Fukuya Fukuyama here, too. He says, For Diamond and Fukuyama, as for Rousseau some centuries earlier, what put an end to that equality everywhere and forever was the invention of agriculture and the higher population levels it sustained. Agriculture brought about a transition from bands to tribes, accumulation of food surplus fed population growth, leading some tribes to develop into ranked societies known as chiefdoms. Large populations, diamond opines, can't function without leaders who make the decisions, executives who carry out the decisions, and bureaucrats who administer the decisions and law. Alas, for all of you readers who are anarchists and dream of living without any state government, those who are reasons... Those are reasons why your dream is unrealistic. You'll have to find some tiny band or tribe willing to accept you, where no one is a stranger and where kings, presidents, and bureaucrats are unnecessary. That's Diamond, he's quoting. Graeber continues, A dismal conclusion, not just for anarchists, but for anybody who ever wondered if there might be some viable alternative to the status quo. But the remarkable thing is that despite the smug tone, such pronouncements are not actually based on any kind of scientific evidence. There is no reason to believe that small-scale groups are especially likely to be egalitarian or that large ones must necessarily have kings, presidents, or bureaucracies. These are just prejudices stated as facts. What do you think about that? Again, I, I love what he's trying to do here and instill a sense of optimism and positivity and that there is a possibility for work to be done and not for there to be some sort of grandiose natural disaster or nuclear fallout or something along those lines for us to be able to to be better, to really be better. I, I like what he's trying to do. I'm, I'm really hoping that there are better examples that he's going to be able to provide in time that kind of show that's not the case. So regarding like small bands, I would actually agree with him. I have studied small bands that were very high art. They had hierarchy. They were stratified just because they were a small group did not mean that there was not inequity. As we begin to scale up though, I've not in my experience seen a lot of examples of large, Large city-states, large empires, large nation-states, those three main, or even kingdoms if we want to throw the Middle Ages in there, where there was not inequity. I've not seen a lot of examples of those. And even in the modern 20th century, where various Marxist governments were able to take hold and attempt to flatten stratification, uh, in many cases, it may have flattened it for much of the population, but there still remained, to borrow from at this point, Marx, a revolutionary vanguard that never actually withered away. And so strat there was still what we would call, in its most basic sense, inequality among the entirety of the population, especially when we look at the large scale. So I guess my critique of what you just said is that you just admitted that every society you've ever studied has been a nation state, a large city state, or a kingdom, etc. Yes, those by definition are all stratified. Well, no, even the even the even the ones before that, before we would get to that status. So, if we look at uh, Arabian tribes before uh, before the arrival of the Prophet Muhammad or something along those times, they they had hierarchy and those were small bands, and I would not call them states. However, conversely, if we look at many of the, especially on the east coast of the United States, indigenous societies before Europeans showed up, those were, in fact, most of them were not as small as we make them out to be. Those were moderately sized. Uh, to use the Iroquois, my favorite example, League of Peace and Power, some posit it was about twenty to 30,000 people and had established, at least in my view, my purview, a more equitable society at that, that size. But I would still never qualify them as like a state, as what we would call an actual state, right? I think all he's arguing is that many people, including Diamond and probably us up to this point, have just assumed that there is some tipping point that once you get to a certain size of population, inequality begins to manifest itself. I think that's what he's arguing. And he's arguing that there is no, there's no, there is no exact population number that right. we can, there's no quantifiable number that here you get to 50,000 inequity before that possibility for right. equitable. When that yeah. one, that 50, yeah, the 50,000th baby is born. Boom. Right. Stratification. So I would agree yeah. with him on that. And yet, like I said, I'm still, I'm, I still want to push back on this idea that you, at least based on historical precedent, that potentially, and again, this is the optimism he's trying to throw in there, and I, I so appreciate it, that potentially something as large as the Soviet Union's attempt, if done better, and maybe the revolutionary vanguard uh, or the intelligentsia was different, somehow it would have been more equitable. I, I, not, it was too big. It was too big. Although I have to argue, like, that's not the point of a socialist society. It's not equity. 
It's dictatorship of the proletariat. That's the definition. And that's where the anarchists and the socialists part ways. Well, they do part ways, but then, in th- again, depending on how we define proletariat, it, they defined it, of course, as soldiers, uh, 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 soldiers, peasants, um, and workers, right? And so that would have been the majority of the population at that time. I mean, this is going to have to be its own episode eventually, but we're going to have to talk about socialism and how the goal isn't actually equity of any kind. It's, in fact, extreme stratification, but the group that's being oppressed is the bourgeoisie. I wouldn't disagree with that, but I'm talking, I guess maybe I'm playing a numbers game here. In proportion, there would have been more equity among the vast majority of living human beings. Don't disagree with that at all. In these attempts. For sure. But that's not the goal, right? But even in that case, it didn't happen. That's, that, I guess, yeah. what I'm saying. Yes. But I guess for the goal of a stateless society, it's not for equity for the majority of the population. It has to be, at least in our utopian vision right now, the equity for everyone, right? Well, as we kind of go through this whole, like, this this thought exercise, does it say, we clearly want equity. But if we're going to, you know, flex our, our what we could, what, what a stateless society could be, a stateless society does not necessarily imply equity I think we, we're probably getting semantics now of like it definitely implies a lack of hierarchy and can you have inequity without hierarchy or authority I think it just implies no state okay that's a much bigger conversation it is I don't give a shit about dismantling the state unless hierarchy goes along with it who cares about the state itself the state's only one manifestation of authority in a society. Well, and this is where we're going to begin to have to define what state is, just as we were asking the question, was that Iroquoian League of Peace and Power, if we want it, could that be defined somehow? Could we manipulate a definition to qualify that as a state? Or the, the, the small band Arabian Bedouin tribe, could that be a state? Like, what is a state? And, yeah, and I that, mean, that's definitely going to be one of the next few episodes which we're digging into in another course called 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 nation building which actually is is the idea of building a nation so that we can critique it but that that's a whole different project Mm -hmm. and 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 we still haven't had the debate yet of whether or not a nation is equivalent to a state correct that's a different topic but okay let's continue with graver he says even archaeologists and anthropologists are guilty in perpetuating the narrative of rousseau so he says quote Still, even when anthropologists and archaeologists try their hand at big-picture narratives, they have an odd tendency to end up with some similarly minor variation on Rousseau. So, the question I want to pose here for this quote is to each of us as individuals, we're both guilty of this as well. Why? Why do we as individuals perpetuate this narrative in our classrooms? Where do we even get it from? Because I had never read Rousseau before this. I read The Social Contract, but I had never read the uh, Discourse on Social Inequality until a week ago, but we still perpetuate this agriculture as the sort of end-all, be-all origin of inequality. I think I'm ready to abandon that. I don't think that you are. Well, as we both would admit, we're more historical materialists, and as you see how humans in the material world have interacted, I th- when we look at the evidence, and again, I'm freely admitting I'm only a historian, so I'm basically picking up on when writing begins, and, and as I just discussed, inequity already exists by the time we have writing. But he um, argues that it already exists b- well before we had agriculture. And that's where I'm having a hard time. Again, this is the bias, and I freely admit, what I, I'm, it's fully subjective here. The bias of my discipline dictates that how much are we really able to understand from everything before writing? We are kind of, as individuals, as individual anthropologists, as individual ar- archaeologists, or even as individual historians, we're going back and looking at these sources, whatever they might be. Maybe they are ruins in, 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 on the Turkey and, Syri- uh, Turkey and Syrian border. Right, or maybe they are pot shards, whatever they might be, and we're making assumptions using our own lens based on the tr- the story we're trying to tell. And I would argue that archaeologists and anthropologists are just as guilty of this as historians. They're going into this with their own, again, subjective biases, seeking to tell a story. And as much as we want that to go away, it never fully does. 
So there are going to be archaeologists and anthropologists that look at things before history, and they're going to make certain assumptions regarding the agricultural revolution being the birth of, 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 of stratification and inequity. And then there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be the Grabers of the world that are going to go back and look at what they have found, look at, and he uses, I don't think he uses this example in his, in this article, but he does in others. I heard it on a podcast he did, Mohenjo-Daro. They're going to look at cities like that and immediately assume because of certain structures, because there's not a clear, like, uh, 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 palace, things along those lines that there's not necessarily an equity there. Those are assumptions. So you're just not willing to accept those yet? Not yet, unless we have some sort of groundbreaking, some sort of magical Rosetta Stone ma- magic document that shows a true... Why does it have to be a document, though? Because you're discounting all of anthropology and archaeology right now. I don't know that it has to be... Okay, maybe it doesn't have to be a document. You can call me out on that. One. I'm okay with that. <laughs> but there has to be some sort of profound finding that indicates that wasn't the case. Like, and maybe. But, you know, okay, so pause there because he can he continues and he'll give us examples that he actually thinks are findings that demonstrate that. So we'll get to that in a second. I personally have I like I said I never read Rousseau. My version of Rousseau's narrative came from Marx, honestly, and reading his various writings. And it wasn't until I actually read the discourse on social inequality from Rousseau that I realized how much Marx had jacked from Rousseau. And I was, like, astonished. Like, I was reading Rousseau and, like, just hearing Marx so much through there, talking about, like, the labor theory of value is, like, it's there. You know, like, all of these things. He even talks about alienation later on, which I had no idea. I had only read Marx. I had never gone back that far to – so that's where my – version of this narrative had come from um but i mean there's always more for us to learn i mean like i said going into that like a historical materialist mindset when you're looking at what was produced before and what was produced after this this magical agricultural revolution which again all of us there is agreement on this the agricultural revolution or whatever we choose to call it the neolithic revolution is not an overnight process. This is a thousands of years process, regardless of where one stands on its impact on on inequity. It, it takes a long time, regardless of where we stand. But what I want to I want to emphasize is clearly what is produced after gives us some sort of material material evidence, a lot more material evidence of inequity than anything else, right? The rise of the old kingdom in Egypt, the rise of the city-states of Mesopotamia, the rise of the Shang dynasty in China, uh, the Aryan uh, quote-unquote migration or immigration from um, the Caucasus down into India, and at that point in time, Mohenjo-Daro all is a, magically abandoned. I don't think those th- two things are accidentally coincide, right? Um, and then, of course, the birth of the caste system thereafter. Um, but all Graeber's the- saying is that even referring to it as a revolution is a misnomer because, like you just said, it took thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. I'm willing to accept that assertion of his for sure, that, that calling it a revolution, whereas, you know, in, in putting it in the same language as, like, what happened in France in 1789 or in Cuba in, in the mid-50s, Yes, that I'm actually willing to accept. That calling it an, a revolution, maybe more so than like an evolution or something along those lines, I, I would agree with Graeber. But on how that. can we even point to agriculture as the delineator if it took tens of thousands of years to actually result in inequality on large populations and civilization? So I think that's why some of the language, especially in anthropology, um, with the Natufian period that we were talking about, I don't know, two, three, four months ago. They're actually, many of them are not even calling it the agriculture anymore. It's more Neolithic because it's right. more than just agriculture. So mm-hmm. you, everybody's right on this. It is more than just learning how to grow things and plot land and irrigate. It's more than this. It's domestication of animals. It's sedentism. It's all these other things that come with it. So it's not strictly agriculture. So if we need a change in language and terminology, and if that's what Graeber's suggesting here, I would agree. A, revolution's probably too much, and agriculture is not the sole reason for this. Okay. I do want to just rewind a second to read a brief quote from Rousseau because you brought up historical materialism, and I forgot to mention this last time, but he has a quote here. This is Rousseau now. He says, In proportion as the human race grew more numerous, men's cares increased. The difference of soils, climates, and seasons must have introduced some differences into their many, their manner of living. Barren years, long and sharp winters, scorching summers, which parts the fruits of the earth, must have demanded a new industry. I literally have highlighted in here, in all of caps, materialism. Like, he legit is talking about historical materialism in the 18th century. Right. 
humans learn from what they observe, and what they observe is the material world, although Neoplatonic theory might debate that. But regardless, I think we're all kind of in line on that one. I just thought it was interesting that Rousseau was talking about materialism, obviously, well before Marx. Um, then, fast forwarding to Graeber again, Graeber takes a brief moment to relate all of these ideas to revolution, which is obviously clearly right up our alley. So I'm going to read this quote. He says, Marxist political parties quickly developed their own version of the story, fusing together Rousseau's state of nature and the Scottish Enlightenment ideas of developmental stages. The result was a formula for world history that began with original primitive communism, overcome by the dawn of private property, but someday destined to return. We must conclude that revolutionaries, for all their visionary ideals, have not tended to be particularly imaginative, especially when it comes to linking past, present, and future. Everyone keeps telling me the same story. Everyone keeps telling the same story. It's probably no coincidence that today, the most vital and creative revolutionary movements at the dawn of this new millennium, the Zapatistas of Chiapas and the Kurds of Rojava, Rojava? We'll go with it. Being only the most obvious examples are those that simultaneously root themselves in a deep traditional past. Instead of imagining some primordial utopia, they can draw on a more mixed and complicated narrative. Indeed, there seems to be a growing recognition in revolutionary circles that freedom tradition and the imagination have always and will always be entangled in ways we do not completely understand. It's about time the rest of us catch up and start to consider what non-biblical version of human history might be like. I love that quote, and, and this is where I'm in lockstep with, with Graeber. I think that he is absolutely correct. Our study of revolution, as we, as we talked about in the very first episode, why, we do what, why we're doing this, has revealed to us that, that revolutions have not been nearly as revolutionary as we like to make them out to be. They are merely seem to be reproducing society on this general trajectory with different language, different nomenclature, different right. Like, there's still a hierarchy. There's still a stratification. There's still the pyramid structure that we like to, to, to beat up on. So I would agree, they're not visionary. And then, of course, by referencing the Zapatistas, one of my favorite groups, um, which we will probably do, a, be, since they, we are going to be teaching them in stateless societies, and I did some graduate research on uh, the construction of their iconography, we're definitely going to be doing an episode on, on the Zapatistas. So I don't really want to give away too much for that episode, but yes, I think that is, that is a wonderful example of imagination and revolutionary thought. So I, I love what Graeber has to say there. But he's arguing here that the reason that they are so in his mind, successful compared to other revolutionary groups is that they still have a very rich link to their history and tradition, which I think we've argued in much of our work that part of the reason in the United States that there aren't significant revolutionary groups making significant revolutionary changes is because the past of this country and its revolutionary past specifically has been silenced. I would agree with you on that. The revolutionary, again, the only revolutionary part of, uh, to use, to pick on the United States that is really usually outlined is the war for independence. And actually most of its revolutionary parts are intentionally, uh, muted, uh, and they're left out of the narrative because again, in any, in any education system, regardless of where it is in the world, but specific to the United States, a K through 12 system is not to, is not intended to make, uh, critical thinkers or revolutionaries or people that challenge authority. It's actually meant to do the opposite. It's meant to make subscribers. And you cannot make subscribers if you teach all of the different ways people resisted the system within your society, uh, especially from the get-go, right? So it's the same conversation we have regarding civil rights, why a Dr. King's methodology is usually higher, revered higher in the education system than a uh, Black Panthers or a Stokely Carmichael or a Malcolm X, right? Like that, it's obvious. Uh, I did it yesterday in, in a classroom. I asked. Who's heard of Emma Goldman, right? Who's heard of Alice Paul? So, I mean, I have, I have, I have people in that class that would identify as feminist, and here I am throwing out these names they've never heard of, and it's not their fault; it's that they've never even been introduced, because those are revolutionaries and revolutionary thinkers. So, yeah. I mean, it's evidenced by the fact that in our revolutions class, we teach the American War for Independence as a revolution, and just that simple fact has landed us in the national news. So, it just proves how people are. A, unaware of that history, and B, so indoctrinated with this sort of innocent version of the war for independence that they can't deal with any alternative. Right, and we're being recorded actually reading from the sources of the time and people, you know, losing their minds over this when we're, re we're, we're pulling our content from the John Adams and the Thomas Paines of the world. Mm -hmm. they, they don't even know what these guys were actually saying, and not that we're in agreement with them on many other things, as you'll find out, but yeah. it's important to understand that... that, that 
Well, I mean, that history is... And here, here I actually have an interesting quote from another French philosopher who we recently uh, uh, just began reading as well for actually the different project of building a nation. Um, but he has an interesting quote. This is... Ernest Renan, in his work, it's not even his work, it was uh, the text of a conference he delivered in 1882. It's called, What is a Nation? And, and going into history, this is important regarding the construction of, of identity and nationhood. He says, forgetting, let me start again, forgetting, I would even say, historical error is an essential factor in the creation of a nation, and it is for this reason that the progress of historical studies often poses a threat to nationality. Historical inquiry, in effect, throws light on the violent acts that have taken place at the origin of every political formation, even those that have been the most benevolent in their consequences. Unity is always brutally established. Um, and I think in contrast to what Graeber's saying about the Zapatistas, they don't forget. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what makes a lot of what they're doing so, or at least appear to be so novel and imaginative. At, at least that's what I'm picking up from what Graeber's saying, and, and in contrast to what Renan is saying here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. And in comparison to, not necessarily mm -hmm. in contrast, yeah. So then Graeber continues and basically starts getting into what the modern research suggests regarding the origins of social inequality. He says, um... Well, he says, first off, we know nothing of human history prior to the Upper Paleolithic period, which begins around 45,000 years ago. Uh, quote, prehistorians have pointed out for some decades to little apparent effect that the human groups inhabiting these environments had nothing in common with those blissfully simple egalitarian bands of hunter-gatherers still routinely imagined to be our remote ancestors. Then he continues and starts to explain how this contradicts uh, Rousseau's agricultural hypothesis. He says that it demonstrates there was inequality long before agriculture and sedentary sites. And the first piece of evidence he uses is evidence of rich burial sites. So he says, quote, to begin with, there is an undisputed existence of rich burials extending back in time to the depths of the Ice Age. Some of these, such as the 25,000-year-old grave from Sungir, east of Moscow, have been known for many decades and are justly famous. For example, dug into the permafrost beneath the Paleolithic settlement at Sungir was the grave of a middle-aged man, buried, as Fernandez Armesto observes, with stunning signs of honor, bracelets of polished mammoth, ivory, uh, diadem or cap of fox teeth, and nearly 3,000 laboriously carved and polished ivory beads. And a few feet away, in an identical grave, lay two children of about 10 and 13 years, respectively, adorned with comparable grave gifts, including, in, this case, in the case of the elder, some 5,000 beads as fine as the adults, although slightly smaller, and a massive lance carved from ivory. Comparably rich burials are, now, are by now attested from the Upper Paleolithic, Rock shelters and open air settlements across, across must, much of Western Eurasia, from the Don to the Dordogne. I don't know how to pronounce the last word. So, what do you think about that? So, I really liked when I was reading this that he now had some good, tangible examples based on the archaeological evidence. Clearly, if you're going to bury somebody and go to this much trouble of adorning them, um, with what at the time would be perceived not just wealth in terms of its material value, but but he uses the word laboriously, right? Like it took a lot of man hours or woman hours to produce these things that were buried. Clearly, these people were quote unquote what we would call special or had some sort of status. Does that status or speciality contrast so much about what either Hobbes or were Rousseau was saying at the time? I don't know. I would not disagree that it does show that these people were, for whatever reason, special in their society and warranted this special treatment. And and if that means inequality, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a leap. I don't know if it's a giant leap, though. So I'm, I'm not in full disagreement. I think he has a great example here. I don't know that we can then, using these, because he has about three other examples, if I recall correctly, I don't know that we can use these three examples to challenge other examples of more egalitarian societies, or maybe we don't have enough of those examples. One of the things that we do with this, and we're all guilty of it, regardless of our discipline at this point, from history to anthropology um, to archaeology, and when we're talking about this idea of human nature, I'm guilty of this, is we'll try and 
take these findings of the ancient past where we don't have these people around anymore, but then look at people that we actually did experience when we began writing things down, again, Native Americans or Aboriginals in Australia or the Maori in New Zealand or whoever, we'll look at their more, quote unquote, I hate this word, simple lifestyle, and then assume that a lot of that can be juxtaposed upon the past. And again, I'm super guilty of this. Like I said, I, I keep using maybe the Iroquois League of Peace and Power as an example or whatever. We, we're all guilty of this. And I think in this way, there's also some guilt on his part as well, is that we're making these assumptions based on only examples, on small examples. I don't think there's enough. So to be blunt, for empires, if we were talking about empires, we have lots of examples. And so there is a very clear trajectory of how a Chinese dynasty, a Roman empire, a Persian empire, an Assyrian kingdom, whatever, there, there was a, a clear trajectory that they had a lot in common in the way they, they founded themselves and then moved forward. These are much more sporadic. So all we, on this front, I would argue we, we have to wait a little bit more for more archaeological discoveries, which will be coming, right? We're getting better at this. Although as a social scientist, I will completely disagree with you and say that if Rousseau is presenting a hypothesis that is, inequality, the origins of inequality are agriculture, to falsify that hypothesis, you would only need to provide one piece of evidence that would demonstrate that inequality existed prior to agriculture, which Graeber does undeniably. But as I think we've already discussed, I'm not sure that anyone, okay, if we're disagreeing with Rousseau, perhaps, but I don't think anyone today that follows a uh, JJ, to, to use his, uh, to his fun name, I don't think anyone really believes it's solely agriculture at this point. But Graeber's saying they do, and that's the, that's the entire problem that he's attacking. I've not run across a lot of those. So even the other anthropologists we've used to actually justify this when we've taught it in class before. I mean, yes, it's much more nuanced than that, but still the biggest thing is agriculture. I think it's the time period we're talking about. Yes, that between, again, that magic time period, 12 to 6,000 BCE, whatever it is. The well, okay, but he's saying here this is 25,000 years old. Right. And then we've got other things that also show, right, the matrilineal society with the Venus it, it, that's 30,000 years old or whatever it is in, in, that was found uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Or the Chauvet paintings or whatever those might be. Now, what they mean, we're all looking at them, looking at these pieces of evidence and applying, honestly, our narrative, our purview to that. So, so you're I, arguing that the rich burial site, we're also applying our perspective to that. That, that doesn't actually necessarily mean inequality. I, 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 what I am admitting is that shows that these people were special and for whatever reason deserved special treatment. But that's inequality. Okay. I mean, if that's how we're going to define it, you are, I'm relying on you now. You're the social scientist here. You're the sociologist. So if that's how we're going to define inequality. I mean, if you want to use okay like it. they're special as a euphemism for inequality, that's fine, but it's still inequality. Okay. Like one person can't be special if another person I'm okay. isn't I'm not okay. special. I will, I will acquiesce on this point. <laughs> Okay, um, then he provides his second piece of evidence, which is the evidence of monumental architecture dating uh, before agriculture. So he says, no less intriguing is the sporadic but compelling evidence for the monumental ar architecture, stretching back to the last glacial maximum. The idea that one could measure monumentality in absolute terms is, of course, as silly as the idea of quantifying ice age expenditure in dollar and cents. It is a relative concept, which makes sense only within the particular scale of values and prior experiences. The Pleistocene has no direct equivalence in scale to the pyramids of Giza or the Roman Colosseum, but it does have buildings that, by the standards of the time, could only have been considered public works, implying sophisticated design and the coordination of labor on an impressive scale. So what do you think about that? I don't really have much commentary that these things have been found, right? Uh, I, like I said, we found these things. They exist. Monumentality. Monuments predate. There are monuments that predate the pyramids and the ziggurat at Ur and great walls and so on and so forth. So I don't, I don't know that I have any, any disagreement that these, and these monuments obviously had to be public works, right? Multiple people had to participate to produce these. We found these. I don't have any disagreement. I don't know what that, what he's getting at in what. Well, I think he's suggesting that that indicates the existence of stratification. Stratification under some sort of supernatural power, I would agree with that. Many of them, what we appear to be pointing to some sort of origin story, which again, I don't think anyone spends enough time talking about the actual stories that motivate this, but that's what we do in our class, so I guess we fill in that blank. 
But yeah, yes, there is definitely inequ- inequity. At this point in time, these fancy things that we talk about in, in uh, uh, we will be talking about more maybe in future podcasts or we definitely talk about in the classroom, ethically constitutive stories, borrowing from the political scientist Roger M. Smith, get my citation in there, um, that they already existed. They Those predate inequity for sure. And if those stories, whatever those stories are, these creation narratives, these origins motivated paying homage to some sort of creator spirit or uh, with the crazy guy on the History Channel, some ancient alien, fine, whatever it might be, so be it. So I guess in that case, there is clearly a stratification, some sort of creative, creative essence, and then below that humanity. That I would agree with. Yeah, but I have to call you out right now because you just discounted all of anthropology and archaeology because no written documents existed, but then you just definitively said that ethically constitutive stories have been around since the dawn of man. Where's the proof? The proof of the ethically constitutive stories? Yeah, you can't have it both ways. The oral transmission. That doesn't count. According to you, the historian that requires documents for evidence of everything. I already said that documents was the incorrect word for me to use right then. (laughs) And a lot of these ethically constitutive stories end up carved, right? In on uh, in the Turkey Turkish ruins. Yeah, but according to you, there's no proof of them existing until that carving takes place. I don't believe I ever said that. So, what we know is that stories predate writing by a, by forever. How do you know? Because we talked about it in the last episode. The minute we begin to communicate, we started telling stories. Now, those stories may have started super. How do we know there is any language? Though we have no idea. Are you, just being, there's are you just being this way for the sake of being this way? Yeah, this obviously, time? but yeah. Because we already had this discussion. So when you, what was it, what was the example we used in the last episode? Something along the lines of, I want to organize a hunt for this gazelle. Even if it's not like what we would call a traditional story, it's not the epic of Gilgamesh or the Iliad or the Odyssey or some bullshit Avengers movie, there's still a communication and a, and a narrative, a way, a plan with a thesis, the thesis being this is how we will kill the gazelle, that existed. But I can, like, pick up my spear and point at a gazelle, and that's different than me telling you an ethically constitutive story. I think it starts there, though. I think it starts with that. And okay. the stories the stories carry on from there. And eventually we get to a point where these stories, and Rousseau says it as well, become so co- they become much more complex. As more and more humans gather, and we learn more, and we want to know more. We're asking these questions, right? Just like we say in class. There's two questions that we think, we think, I'm not saying definitively, humans have been asking for a really long time. We don't know how long, but a really long time. Why am I here? And what happens when I die slash in the future? Again, we don't know when they started asking that question. We don't even know if other species asked that question. They might. I'm not willing to say they don't. But that's when we start developing these stories. Although now that I'm thinking this through, like that is such an assumption of our present, it's presentism, because we ask those questions. Were men 25,000 years ago asking that question? I don't ask those questions. Yes, you do. Why am I here? I mean, I guess I asked that question. Like, what, what, what's the point of, of being here doing I this mean, podcast? I mean, we as in, like, modern humans. No. I mean, I guess... We, I, get, I'm, here's the thing. I've already prefaced this. Yes, I am part of the process. I am part <laughs> of the subjective biased lens where I am fully socialized and conditioned into thinking a certain way and looking at things through a certain lens. So, yeah, I'm willing to admit that. I'm not above this. I, I'm not, you know, if, if anyone is above this, it's, I don't know, it's our great creative spiritual essence. I don't know what that is. It's Lord Krishna. Okay, then Graeber goes and tells us exactly what we should make of this new evidence, the rich burial sites and the monumental architecture. He says, quote, What then are we to make of all this? One scholarly response has been to abandon the idea of egalitarian golden age entirely and conclude that rational self-interest and accumulation of power are the enduring forces behind human social development. But this doesn't really work either. Evidence for institutional inequality in Ice Age societies, whether in the form of grand burials or monumental buildings, is nothing if not sporadic. Burials appear literally centuries and often hundreds of kilometers apart. Even if we put this down to the patchiness of the evidence, we still have to ask why the evidence is so patchy. After all, if any of these Ice Age princes had behaved anything like, say, Bronze Age princes, we'd be finding fortifications, storehouses, palaces, all the usual trappings of emergent states. Instead, over tens of thousands of years, we see monuments and magnificent burials, but little else to indicate the growth of ranked societies. So, I mean, that that just kind of coincides with the idea that the evidence is patchy and it's separated Mm -hmm. by large geographic zones and centuries. So, I mean, like I said, the trajectory is much less clear than if we were picking apart empire building. Yeah, exactly. Okay, then he goes on to say, like, this is his main thesis. 
quote, a wider look at the archaeological evidence suggests a key to resolving this, the dilemma. It lies in the seasonal rhythms of prehistoric social life. Most of the Paleolithic sites discussed so far are associated with evidence for annual or biennial periods of aggregation, linked to the migrations of game herds, whether woolly mammoth, steppe bison, reindeer, or gazelle, as well as cyclical fish runs and nut harvests. At less favorable times of year, at least for at least some of our Ice Age ancestors no doubt really did live and forage in tiny bands. But there is overwhelming evidence to show that at others they congregated, feasting on a superabundance of wild resources, engaging in complex rituals, ambitious artistic enterprises, and trading minerals, marine shells, and animal pelts over striking distances. Such seasonal patterns of social life endured long after the invention of agriculture. It is supposed to have changed everything. New evidence shows that alter, alternations of this kind may be the key to understanding the famous Neolithic monuments of the Salisbury Plain, and not just in terms of calendric symbolism. And I think that kind of, I mean, honestly, while it, it, he attempts to challenge the agricultural revolution narrative, he actually reinforces the surplus narrative in my opinion, a little bit there. And that's what I was thinking as I was going through that. That, yes, okay, so fine. The surplus existed in some times, some ways, before the agricultural revolution. Again, during migratory periods or when there is a giant hunt of mammoth or bison or whatever it might be. That's still a resource that becomes a surplus and ritualization, a little bit of stratification, maybe some needed leadership. That's when that rises, but it was still based on the material resource being more plentiful at that time and the gathering of a larger population. Okay. He says, this is important, uh, quote, why are these seasonal variations important? Because they reveal that from the very beginning, human beings were self-consciously experimenting with different social possibilities. And that's his main point throughout this work. Uh, he provides three examples, which, yeah, we're going to have to go into because this is key. The first one is the Inuit, he says. Anthropologists describe societies of this sort as possessing a double morphology. Marcel Mauss, writing in the early 20th century, observed that the circumpolar Inuit, and likewise many other species, have two social structures, one in the summer and one in the winter, and that in parallel they have two systems of law and religion. In the summer months, Inuit dispersed into small patriarchal bands in pursuit of freshwater fish, caribou, and reindeer, each under the authority of a single male leader. Property was possessively Marked and patriarchs exercised coercive, sometimes even tyrannical power over their kin. But in the long winter months, when seals and walrus flocked to the Arctic shores, another social structure entirely took over as Inuit gathered together to build, build great meeting houses of wood, whale rib, and stone. With them, the virtues of equality, altruism, and collective life prevailed. Wealth was shared. Husbands and wives exchanged partners under the aegis of Sedna, the goddess of the seals. The second example are the hunter. 